Hey everyone, this is part two of our lecture for performance characteristics and applications of PID control, which is chapter seven and eight of chemical and bioprocess control from James Riggs. Okay, so last time we talked a little bit about um, the effects of proportional and integral terms on feedback control performance. And today we're going to start by looking at the properties of derivative action and then um, direct versus reverse acting as a controller setting and go through a variety of different examples um, that show when we might incorporate a different mode of PID control. Okay, so the properties of derivative action. So again, if we think about a PID controller that's operating in derivative mode only, so the proportional and the integral terms are inactive, the uh, position form for the controller, so the controller output is a function of time, would look like C, so C equals C naught, so the initial value, plus then the derivative term, which is the gain times the derivative time constant times the derivative of the error with respect to time. Okay, so we can go through and we can derive the transfer function for a derivative only controller. So if the transfer function for a derivative only controller is then going to look something like Kc tau d s. All right, so <clears throat> what we did previously is we looked at, we derived the, um, the overall closed loop transfer function, so the, which is in here we're saying it's the sense value, or it's actually ys divided by y specified. And again, this is just the product of the transfer functions from the input to the output over one plus the product of the transfer functions of the loop. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna skip the analysis that we did last time, and I'm just gonna go right to the final form that we would get if we incorporated it all together and then put it into standard form. And this would look something like Kc, Kp, tau d, s, all over tau p squared, s squared, plus, in parentheses, it's going to be 2 zeta tau p plus Kc, Kp, tau d, all times s plus 1. Okay, and so this right here, this is a derivative-only control applied to a second-order process. And then again here, we're assuming the actuator is fast and the sensor is fast. Or you can also think about this as the combination of the um, actuator and the sensor give rise to a second-order process. So now to see the effect of the derivative term, we can see here that the time constant itself doesn't, doesn't change. Right, but we can see this term right here, which is for a um, for a general second order process, this is going to look like something like 2 tau p, we'll just put primes here, zeta prime. Okay, so we can see, essentially, we know there's no change in tau p, so there's probably going to be some sort of change in, in the zeta term. And so if we equate this right here to this term, we can show essentially that zeta prime equals, because again, tau p prime equals tau p, so this is going to equal zeta plus kc kp tau d over 2 times tau p. Right, so in all cases what you see is that, you know, there's no change in tau p, but because these terms are all positive, and again kc times kp has to be a positive number, so this term right here is going to be a positive number, so what this means is that zeta prime is always going to be greater than zeta. And what, what, what Essentially, in terms of the process dynamics, that means is that there's going to be less oscillations because zeta is going to be greater. It's going to be more towards overdamped. So if you want to think about what's the effect of the derivative action on the um, overall performance of a feedback control loop, it doesn't have an effect on the offset. It doesn't increase the response time, but it decreases oscillation. So it's going to make those loops smaller. Now, the benefit of making those loops smaller is we can increase the gain to make so we can make the loop smaller by adding the derivative term, and then that allows us to add gain to make the process respond faster. So we can use derivatives to allow us to, to achieve the same sort of you know, number of oscillations, but using a much higher gain. 
Okay, so let's look at a couple slides. Let's look at a couple figures to see the effect of each particular term. Okay, so shown on this slide, we can see on the top, we have y, this is the control variable. This right here is the controller output. And this, and this figure up here, a is showing um, the overall output. And then this right here is the controller output by p. So this would be the proportional term, the integral term, and the derivative term. Notice that there's two sides. We'll just talk about the left side. So this is essentially um, set point changes. So this is the performance due to set point changes. And over on the other side, we're looking at disturbance rejection. And we can tell that because over here, we see that we have a set point change. And over here, there's no change in the control variable set point, but there's a disturbance that causes it to go off. And then we look at how the system responds. Okay, so for set point changes, you see here that initially when there's a large error, the proportional term dominates. And we can achieve a, a larger change in the proportional term because the derivative term is kind of counteracting it. So it's preventing it from overshooting as much. So these terms are essentially offsuiting each other to allow the response to be a little bit faster initially. Um, and then the integral term, which you can see in here, is it just kind of provides that offset removal. Um, so, so far we've, we've talked, we looked at the um, P, I, and then the derivative term. So, um, in most cases, uh, a PI control is, uh, yeah, in most cases, PI control is sufficient to, to give good performance for most um, control loops in the chemical process industry. Um, PID controllers are often used for slower processes such as you know maybe a temperature or composition. These are typically slower processes but oftentimes the derivative terms is not required and actually the derivative term can be negative in terms of the performance of a process. So in many cases if you know if you're working on a controller that's set up in PID mode a lot of times you can improve the performance just by turning off the derivative term because it's not applied properly in many cases. Okay, so let's look at that. When is the derivative term useful? Um, okay, so a sluggish process is a process that has a very large dead time. Okay, so if the dead time is low, so if the dead time relative to the time constant is low, um, derivative action won't actually help improve the performance very much at all. Um, Okay, coming back to this slide. So I, I, let me mention one more thing. So the general metric is in terms of Riggs suggests that the use of derivative action is useful when theta p over tau p is greater than one. In this case, we would use PID. Okay, another heuristic is if theta over p, if theta over tau p is less than 0 0.5, use PI. The derivative term won't help you at all or won't help you very much that it's important for in this case and so some cases in the middle here so if this theta over tau p is greater than 0.5 or less than 1 here you might have to use a little bit of judgment you know you can use the derivative term if it's not an, um, adversely affecting your process and we'll see how that shows up in a little bit okay so again for the case where theta p over tau p is less than 0 0.5, you can see if we tune a controller for pi only, we get this white line, lighter line, and if we use it with derivative term, you see this darker line. So there is a little bit less oscillation, and the performance is a little bit different. But if you calculate the overall error, it's, it's not going to be very it's not going to be very different between these two. And by avoiding the use of the derivative term, you save yourself potential complications in the controller response, especially if you have severe disturbances to the process. Okay, so in cases where we have a high, and again, we're talking about theta p over tau p is greater than one, in these cases, you can benefit from PID control, right? And the light line right here shows is that, you know, there's much more oscillations in here, and by adding the derivative term, it's essentially decreasing these oscillations. And also in the other case of the derivative, this is probably, this is responding or can respond a little bit faster because the use of the gain term can be a little bit higher. Okay, this is due to the, you know, the process is a little bit sluggish. So use of the derivative term is we can really crank that gain up 
and then the derivative term will have us back off when we start when the process starts changing too much and keep it from overshooting. Okay, one of the main issues that's associated with too much derivative action is you can get what's you can get um, what's called derivative kick. Or yeah, so you can the process can stall out in some cases. So what we can see here is that um, here is some measured value. Maybe there was a disturbance that affected the process. So at some point the process was disrupted. Okay, once the process moves too far away from the set point, what happens is the controller is going to kick in, and if it's a slow process, it's going to take a while, and then all of a sudden the controller is going to kick in, and it's going to try to bring us back down to the set point too quickly. If there's a high derivative term, that high derivative term is going to pull back on the derivative action and cause the process to go in the opposite direction. And that's kind of rinse repeat on the process. So you can kind of get this stalling out or stair step type of response because the derivative term, you know, sort of thinks that the process is going to end up overshooting in the opposite direction and it's trying to prevent that from happening. So it essentially makes it take a little bit longer to respond because both the, the uh, proportional term and the derivative term are too high. Okay, so let me give you a practical summary here. Um, there are cases where it is best to only use P-only control. There are cases where it is best to use PI control, and there are cases that it's best to use PID control. And it's important to understand those and not over control your system. So P-only control is sufficient if you have a fast responding process that doesn't require offset free oscillate, doesn't require offset free operation. So something like this would be um, level and pressure controllers. So, for example, if you have a um, an integrating process, an integrating process is a process that if you make a change to the process, it doesn't reach a new steady state. Right? If you are controlling an integrating process and it's fast responding like level or pressure, then um, P-only control will get you there, will give you the best control of the process. So integrating process, fast responding process, that don't require offset free oscillation, P-only control. Um, P-only control uh, will give you offset, yeah, so we, have to, we just said that, on the oscillating process. Um, if the integral, inter if integral action is added, the control performance can decrease because it's not responding as fast as possible. Um, P-only control is also useful if you, if you have cases where you don't really care about offset, like if there's not a specific set point, um, and this is an example, this would be used in when you have a um, on a, a flow control loop, for example, where you have a valve positioner. So the valve positioner on the valve often has P-only control to keep the valve moving. Um, P PI control is used for most processes where offset free operation. So for example, flow temperature composition loops, level and pressure loops, um, where they're you know, self-regulating processes or non-integrating processes, and this accounts for typically about 90%. Um, and then again, we said derivative action can be used, but again, for derivative action, we only, only, only use derivative action if we have theta p over tau p is greater than 1, or 0.5, and between 0.5 and 1, you can analyze the process. All right, so the next thing we're going to look at is the last settings we have PID, and we can also decide does the controller need to be reverse or direct acting. And essentially, you can think about this as, you know, what is the sign? What does the sign of KC need to be? So oftentimes, can the the KC is thought to be or is essentially set to be a positive value. All the PID are positive values. Um, in some cases, you need the process to respond in the opposite direction in order to remain stable. So I will just kind of give you the, the summary right here. Um, the summary is, is, is it if the product of the gains, so product of the gains is less than zero, um, the, using positive feedback or reverse action will result in unstable behavior. Therefore, if the product of the gains is less than zero, we need to use direct action. Okay, so the product of the gains, what that means is you have the gain of the controller set to be positive. Um, 
The gain of the sensor is going to be positive because the sensor has to move in the same direction. Uh, the gain of the actuator and the gain of the process could be negative. Okay, certain actuators, like for example, air to um, air to close actuators, are going to have a negative gain. More pressure, you close the valve. Higher signal, close the valve. Some processes can have negative gains as well. So the bottom line is, if, if the product of the gains is less than zero, you use direct action. You need to use a direct acting controller. Um, okay, so let's let's think about how this works a little bit. Um, let's see, do I have a slide? I'm going to go ahead and give myself um, a slide here just to show you a little bit. All right, so let's consider a case where um, yfs is greater than y specified. So this would mean the process that the sense value had increased relative to what the specified value is. Okay, in this case, the error, which equals y specified minus ys, in this case, the error would be negative because ys is greater than that. So if the error is negative, um, since since case C is positive, okay, if this is set up in, go back here, if it's set up in reverse acting where we're, where we're required to just add this, okay, if the error is negative, the gain would be positive, and that means the controller signal, that means the controller signal, whatever the signal coming out of the controller is going to be negative. Okay, so then the control signal goes to the actuator. So now let's consider if Ka is positive, air to open, or valve with a positioner, that means that the input, U, going into the process is going to be negative. Okay, now if Kp is positive, so Kp, that's the process, that means Y is going to be negative. Right, because again, a decrease, a decrease in input, the gain is positive, that means a decrease in the output. And then also, since we know Ks is positive, that means Ys is going to be negative. Okay, so in this case, Ys is negative, that means the sense value is going to decrease. Right, so if the sense value decreases, that means ys is going to go back down towards y specified. Right, that's exactly what we want to achieve. So in this case, because we have all positive gains, we want to use a reverse acting controller, which is going to add the controller, the change in the controller. Now let's assume just for a second that the process actually here, kp, is negative. If kp were negative, that means y would now be positive. And then, since Ks is positive, that means Ys would also. Um, that means Ys would also be positive, and that means Ys would increase. So that means Y would go further away from Y specified, and we would not get us back down to the set point. So in this case, we actually have to subtract the controller change which means direct acting controller. Okay, so that's the difference between one versus the other. All right, so let's look at the example. So we can, maybe you can pause this and go through this example when I uh, look at it here. So for a level control, we wanna decide, do we want a direct, are we want a reverse acting or direct acting controller? So first we wanna look at the sign of KP, the sign of KA, um, and then work through the system. We'll go and say for this example that um, Ka is positive. It's an air to open. We'll say air to open. Ka is positive. Okay, so work through this example and tell me if we would want to have a direct acting controller or a reverse acting controller. Okay, so again, Ka we said is positive. Kc is set to be positive. Um, Ks equals positive. So what about Kp equals what? This is what we really need to know. So we need to look at the process and decide 
is Kp going to be positive or negative? So in this case, we're controlling the flow out. Okay, so if we we're controlling the flow out, so essentially that's the input to the process. So if we increase flow out, which is our manipulated variable, this causes the level to decrease. All right, so that means our process would have a negative gain. Okay, so here, because the product of the gains is negative, we are going to use a direct acting controller. All right, so here's just shows a summary of the selection of direct versus re reverse acting controller. Uh, you can read through these. This is essentially what we talked about previously. Um, next, we're gonna go through a few applications of flow control loops, or ap applications of control loops. So first, we'll start talking about a flow control loop. Okay, so since, um, since the flow in the process, um, the flow response to the change in the valve opening, these are all very fast. The dynamics of the flow loop are most controlled by the dynamics of the control valve and the actuator. So here the control valve and the actuator. Okay, so one of the issues of control loops is you can run into things that's called, uh, you have issues of dead band. And so dead band is essentially how much you have to change the input to realize a change in the valve position. Okay, so you can think about it on a steering wheel. Like in some cases, your steering wheels are a little bit light. You might have to turn a certain amount in order to get the wheels to respond. That would be your, your dead band. Okay, so the dead band for industrial control loops is typically about plus or minus 10%, maybe up to, in some cases for old valves, 25% or large valves. So as a, revol as, as a result, what this means is that small changes an air pressure applied to the valve may not cause the actual valve to move. So what's going to happen is you're going to ask for a slight, you're going to ask for, you know, if you need a change in the valve position, right, the air pressure is going to increase a little bit, increase a little bit more, and then at some point, the stem position on the valve is going to move once the air pressure is changed by enough. All right, and this is going to limit the effectiveness of the control on the process. So which means that the valve is going to stick, and then it's going to end up jumping from position to position. So in order to solve this problem, um, valves often are equipped with what's called a valve positioner. And a valve positioner is essentially a, um, a, it's a P-only controller with a very high gain applied to the valve. And in this case, what happens is that the, the um, controller sends a signal to the valve positioner and then the valve positioner moves to stem position as needed. Okay, so essentially the valve positioner is telling the valve to open up and oscillate like this such that when small changes in the air pressure are given, the valve can move seamlessly to the next position. When valve positioners are used, the dead band is reduced to around 0.5%. So you can see automatically you can get significant improvements in control for these processes. All right, so let's look at level control loops. So for a, a level control loop, uh, the dynamic of the sensor and the actuator are actually fast. Um, so for a level control loop, if you need tight control over the set point, you can use a PI controller with a small amount of interval. Otherwise, generally for level P only control. And again, if it's an integrating process, use P only. Uh, pressure control loops are going to be about the same. So again, in some cases, pressure control loops are integrating, such as if it's a vent valve system, and there are some cases where pressure loops are, um, are not integrating in their self-regulating processes. For example, if you change the pressure on a steam line, right, you're gonna, the valve's gonna open up and then the, the, the system's gonna achieve a new pressure. When you vent it, it's just gonna vent to atmosphere, which is not really a steady state condition, it's more of a process limitation. So for pressure control loops, typically you can get away with P-only controller. Again, unless you have a um, non-integrating or self-regulating process that offset elimination is important and then use a PI controller. So you have to actually think about how the process is responding before you select the controller type. Uh, temperature control loops, I mean these are typically going to be PI or PID, almost always temperature control loops are always, they'll be uh, self-regulating processes so you have to use at least the integral term. 
Um, really, the test here is to determine the dynamics of the process, maybe run an open loop and fit a first order, fit a first order plus dead time model to an open loop response and look at what is the ratio of the dead band to the time constant. And if this is greater than one, use PID. If it's not, just stick with PI control. A composition control loops are a similar way. Typically the dead band on a composition loop, especially if it has a sampling system, is very large. And composition control loops are generally going to use PID controller, mostly because of the sampling system. Again, we can run an open loop response to see if you can use a, a PI controller, which will be a little bit more efficient and reliable, but often cases the PID control is uh, benefits a composition loop, particularly those that have a composition or an analyzer type sensor. A dissolved oxygen loops, I mean, these are typically, these can use PI control, um, anything where the process is fast. And again, you know, again, we go back to the general heuristic is just looking at the relative time constant or the relative dead band to the time constant, um, seeing if that's greater or less than one, and you can decide what to use in the system. Biomass. Um, biomass always involves this sort of sluggish growth period where there's a lag phase and pretty much always in biomass PID controllers are used because it's such a slow process. Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk about um, some a few digital implementation issues and I'm going to go through these quickly. You can go back and review them in the notes. Uh, some of these things are just, it's useful to be aware of them. Um, in terms of implementing them, these are not necessarily things you might have to do, but you should be aware of potential issues associated with how controllers might be operating in case certain problems arise. Okay, so again, control systems operate digitally. So we showed examples of, we, we have a couple things where we had derivatives and integral terms, and these are sort of continuous functions and sort of and so in order to use them in a digital implementation we have to essentially discretize them or we have to make them into delta t's so we can approximate the integral term by using this kind of trapezoid rule or like a Riemann sums type calculation um, we can also do backwards and differencing to approximate to uh, approximate the derivative so it's just going to be the error at this time minus the previous error over delta t. So again, we need to we can substitute those um, digital implementations in for the positional form of the PID control and we'll end up with this relationship. Uh, we just find n and this would be the number of steps which is the current time divided by no, delta t. So in terms of in the integral term we have to sum over all of those individual time steps. Um, okay, so now remember that the, the controller or all these transfer functions are deviation variables, so they result from changes. So it's, it's, it's going to be the change in the controller output. And so we can take two different, we can take the positional form of the PID algorithm at two different time periods and take the difference to come up with the delta t. We want, we want the change in the controller output. Okay, and the act that the two controllers um, times that we have access to are the current time, so what it is it right now, and then what was the previous value. Okay, so if we take these two and we just take the difference between the two, do a little bit of math, we're going to see we end up with our position, our, here's our um, proportional term, integral term, and our derivative term. So you can see here it's just the difference in error between the current and the previous, and we also have the accumulation of the error and then we have the derivative between a couple points. And again, this is just numerical derivative method. Uh, again, two different forms. We have reverse acting and we have direct acting. In one case, we are adding the delta t, and in the other case, we are subtracting the delta t. And really what that does is, effectively, it just changes the sign of the kc. OK, because of this digital form, there's a variety of problems that can happen. Okay, one of them is what's called derivative kick. So derivative kick is when you have a set point change apply and it causes a spike in the derivative of the error from the set point. Because right, again, we have a, a change in the set point, 
between one time and the next time, you essentially have an infinite slope or nearly infinite slope. And if you have a really high slope, the derivative of that is approaches infinity and it causes the derivative term to be really high. And this only occurs on set point changes. So in the, in, to remove this from set point changes, we can just replace, we can just make the derivative uh, or replace the approximation of the derivative based on the error um, from the set point with the negative approximation of the derivative based on the measured value of the control variable. So this is going to be measured value of control variable. All right, and this makes sense again because the error, error at the current time is y specified at the current time minus ys at the current time. Right? If there's no set point change, if the problem occurs in set point changes, then we have to correct that. If there's no set point change, the error at t minus delta t is going to be the same. Y specified at t minus delta t is the same, right? but what would be different is now is just the error. So the difference between these two, when these two are zero, it's just the difference between the sense values. So we can substitute that in there, and that will prevent derivative kick from causing problems for set point changes. Uh, similarly, we can run into problems for aggressive set point tracking. So for certain processes, if we tune the controller for um, a good disturbance rejection performance results in excessive aggressive action for set point changes. So the problem is corrected by removing the um, set point from the proportional term. The set point track then set point tracking is only accomplished by interval action only because again the interval is what causes the removal of the offset. And again for set point changes this might make it a little bit slower, but again it solves the necessary problems that show up when you do set point changes based on the um, proportional and the derivative term. So again in the same way that we looked at for the derivative term, we just replace the error in the proportional term with a sense value in, this, in the proportional term. All right, so again, now if we just as a summary, there's three versions of the um, PID algorithm commonly used in the DCS controllers. And again, DCS controller, we think about this as it's a digital controller, so it's kind of cyclic calculations that are done every you know, second or every few seconds. So the standard form, numerical form, based on the error. Um, the form in which the proportional and the integral terms are based on the error, while the derivative term is based on the sense value. And then both the proportional and the derivative are based on the sense value. And set point checking changes are only done based on the integral term. OK, other problems that can show up with digital calculations is the effect of a noisy sensor. So noisy sensor can cause a lot of variations, and these variations aren't real changes to the process. Um, I want to note that we're not going to focus too much on sensors, but I just want to introduce it here, and then we'll come back to this a little bit later. So by having, um, by improving, um, by filtering the signal, we can remove some of these variations caused by a noisy sensor, and this actually will end up improving the general performance of the system. Okay, so shown here is the effect of the uh, process response um, with a filtered sensor. So just to see how filtering can be done, so um, the equation, or the filtering is essentially a first order process. So um, we're gonna apply a first order filter. So what that means is we have tau f times, so we're going to filter the sensor signal. So we're going to have df or dyf, so this is going to be the filter signal dt, plus yf equals kf times ys. So the input for the filter is the sense value. The value coming out of the sensor is the yf, so that's our output. Now again, this one k, the gain of the filter, this right here should be 1. And then there's going to be a time constant of the filter. And then this time constant of the filter is going to depend on how much filtering we actually do. So our, our filter is just going to be a, a fairly simple equation. It's the filter value 
equals some filter factor times the sense value at the current time plus 1 minus the filter factor times the sense value or the filtered value at the previous time, t minus delta t. Okay, so this, this right here is yf at t minus delta t. So here, think about it here. So the filtering is like an average. So if f equals 0 0.5, right, so we're taking half of the current sense value plus half of the previous filtered value. The previous filtered value would be half of the sense value plus half of the previous one. So it's kind of takes a, it takes essentially a working average. The closer this is to one, the less filtering it is. Okay, so the more sensor noise is going to be important. And then the, the, the lower this is, the more filtering that you have, but also the lower the filter value, the more lag you're going to add to the process. So this filtering essentially is going to add lag to the process. So the filtering reduces the effect of sensor noise by approximating a running average. So it's going to add lag when filter measurement is used. So use the necessary minimum amount of filtering necessary. So if I want to look at the feedback loop with the sensor filtering, essentially what we're adding is another transfer function between the sense value and the error. And now here the error is based on the filter signal and the sensor. Now I'll point out that oftentimes the sensor will come equipped with a filter on it. So it's not necessarily a separate entity. It would just be a setting that you might add on your sensor. But again, note that this is going to affect your performance of the feedback loop as we've shown here because of the added lag to the process. All right, we can go through and, and do the analysis that we did before, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of put this on hold right now, and what you can do is look over some of the notes. The important thing to note here is that based on the relative values of the sensor, as you add more sense, as you add more filtering or less filtering, it can affect the process in different ways depending on the relative speed of the filter compared to that of the overall process. So some of the information that we need to analyze is that, you know, tau f, mathematically, this tau f is equal to delta t, delta, um, it's going to be delta t times 1 over f minus 1. Okay, so as f becomes small, tau f becomes large. So if tau f is small compared to tau p, um, the zeta will actually decrease when tau f is increased. But if tau f, if the opposite is true, if tau f is large compared to tau p, then zeta will actually increase when tau f is increased. So this can lead to more or less oscillations by adding, by, or by adding or by changing the filter. Okay, just looking at, you know, a couple things here. The more, again, more filtering that we add, the more lag. So as F gets smaller, adds more lag. The process is slower in responding, but it's smoother response. Again, if we start going too, too low, we can start seeing in this case right here, too, too low, the process is really slow in responding. And again, it's going to end up um, taking a while to settle back out on the set point. So somewhere around here, 0.5 to 0.2, and you can generally um, you know, vary this parameter and see the effect on the process to decide which amount of filtering you need. Generally, less if you know you want to go with less filtering or a higher value of f um, to make sure that your you know your current sense value is um, being considered in or is being strongly weighted in the calculation of the change to the process. Okay, so. Just as a quick overview of these chapters, uh, the characteristic equation of the closed loop, that's one plus the product of the transfer functions of the loop. This is what the determines the dynamic behavior and the stability. Um, when, I, when, when analyzing the dynamics, we consider all the processes separately. Then we combine them together for the whole closed loop transfer function. Um, controllers can use proportional integral and derivative action. It doesn't have to, you know, it, it's pretty much I always use proportional. So you don't ever use one without proportional. So it's either proportional, proportional integral, or proportional integral derivative. Um, PI is most common. If offset is not important, or if it's an integrating process, P only. 
if the process is sluggish, PID. And then again, remember to consider the process logic to use to correct controller actions. So you use direct versus reverse. And you can determine this just based on the product of the gains um, of the actuator and the process. Okay, so that's going to do it for these chapters. Um, we'll see you next time.